that is a way in the major. We have number 475, Children's Church is dismissed on the last stanza. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. 475, let's stand. Sermon passages from Psalm 126. I want to read it responsively. So I'll read the first verse, and then you can read the second, and we'll go that way. So I'll begin with verse 1. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion... We were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, they that sow in tears, shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Father, we give you praise because your promises are guaranteed. You made a promise to Abraham thousands of years ago. You showed him all of the magnificent stars in heaven and promised that his offspring would be as many as the stars, more than the sands that are on the earth, all the little grains of sand. And how many 
have his children been? He had so many sons. And we, indeed, are children of Abraham who follow after Christ. We are Abraham's seed. But Lord, the blessing of Abraham did not just extend to his family and his offspring, but you gave him a blessing, a blessing of land, that he would have a land, he and his family, and it would be an eternal blessing, that it would forever be his land. And there in his land, on Mount Zion, you have placed your holy hill where all the world one day will come and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. And what a wonderful blessing that is. And even though centuries have come and gone where others have occupied that land, it is still Abraham's land. And so, Father, we look for the time when it will be restored to him and when he will walk its many paths himself again. And Lord, a blessing you gave him. And the blessing, of course, is in Christ. And though Isaac was his chosen son, chosen by you over Ishmael and the sons of Keturah, that you gave Isaac this promise and Jacob this promise and Jacob's sons this promise, there was a blessing in that. For out of Judah would come one who is to be ruler in Israel. And from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, the least among the cities of Judah, would come the one who would rule, whose reign and rule is from of old. He is eternally the son. And he is exalted, and we exalt him here. He's the head of this church. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to remember the beautiful blessings of your promises. They are eternal. They are guaranteed. And as we pray and you answer prayer and we give you thanks, may we learn that our thanksgiving shapes our prayers. And that as we pray for new things in the future, new expectations based on your promises, our thanksgiving for answered prayer of the past is the basis of that prayer for things in the future. We look for the time when Jesus will return and set up his kingdom. Oh Lord, come quickly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's amazing how different cultures look at each other. And of course, in Japan, I have mentioned this last year, in Japan, every Christmas day, they celebrate Christmas by eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. And because they, they think that's what we do here. In the 1950s, uh, because of some really slick advertising by this American company, they became convinced that all Americans eat Kentucky Fried Chicken at the, on Christmas Day. And so starting early in December, you have to get your order in. If you go on Christmas Day, the line is hours long if you want to get your chicken. Well, even though the world has gotten small through technology, it's still pretty big because they have that really wrong. I don't know about you, but I don't have Kentucky Fried Chicken on Christmas Day. I don't even think they'll be open on Christmas Day here in the United States. Well, let me give you another anecdote of something like this. Long time ago, uh, actually growing up, I watched the Andy Griffith show, as many of you did. And uh, as an adult, I thought it'd be really nice to own all of the seasons of Andy Griffith. So we bought them all on DVD. And we owned those uh, episodes, those DVDs. And, and then, of course, all of the streaming services have them available. So we decided to give them to Alex and Elizabeth, who live in India, whose internet is so spotty, they just couldn't ever watch anything. And so I thought this would be nice for them to have. And they began watching them in India and apparently invited over some Indian family to watch with them. And one such family became convinced that this is America. They saw Andy Griffith and they thought that's what Americans are like. 
this is what America is like. And I don't know if they think all of America is in black and white or not. It's just there's no color over here, but they became convinced. And I thought, this is how Kentucky Fried Chicken on Christmas gets started. This is how rumors like that happen. It's just kind of this cultural confusion. And of course, Andy Griffith is important to those of us who live in North Carolina. If you're from North Carolina especially, I mean, you go downtown Raleigh, down to Pullen Park, and you can see a statue of Andy Griffith and, uh, hit, and Ron Howard, his son in the show, played Opie. And um, you can see that statue, of course, about 30 minutes from here. The lady who played Aunt B lived in a house given to her by Siler City. And of course, Andy Griffith himself is from his hometown in Mount Airy, North Carolina. A number of years ago, uh, we were visiting Mount Airy, just kind of a fun thing to do. We got Aaron's haircut in Floyd's Barber Shop. We went down to eat at the diner, the snappy lunch. I mean, all of these kind of things. And, and we went into uh, a little Andy Griffith kind of museum. It was there at the time. Now it's been, it's been moved into a museum. Apparently, you have to pay money to get into it now. But back then, you could walk in. And, and our family walked into this place, this emporium. And behind the counter was a man. And he was packing everything up. And he had all sorts of Andy Griffith memorabilia. And it was kind of fun to be able to talk to him. Actually, he was a childhood friend of Andy Griffith. And if you know anything about the later episodes, there's a, after the character who plays Floyd dies, um, there's a uh, Emmett the Fix-It Man. And this man was Andy Griffith's friend. That character is based on him. So it was kind of neat to be able to talk to him. Now, I don't know if you know about Emmett, and if you probably don't because most people think there are only five seasons of Andy Griffith and they're all black and white. But actually, there are three color seasons of Andy Griffith. And most people are unaware of that. In fact, if you ever play somebody in Andy Griffith trivia and you don't know that, you're going to lose because a lot of questions come from the color seasons, seasons six through eight. And if you missed out on those seasons, you missed out on one of the best episodes that ever aired. It's called The Battle of Mayberry. And in this episode, Opie is tasked with writing an essay about this battle that took place between the settlers who settled Mayberry and the Native Americans. And so Opie goes around and asks everybody their story, what they knew about this battle, and everybody in town has somebody who fought in the battle, and they're all a colonel. It's, it's kind of the running joke, right? He, and then he even goes to the Native American who lives in town, and he's got a completely different version of the battle. His side won the battle in his version, and, and they have a different name for it. And it's just really cute how the whole thing goes. But then Opie goes to Raleigh. He reads a newspaper account of the battle and learns uh, a really shocking truth and writes his essay, and he wins. And the shocking truth is there was no Battle of Mayberry. And the whole town is really disappointed. Now, I'm telling you all this for a reason. And some of you have already kind of given me that look of where is he going with this. My own wife gave me that look. I'm telling you this for a reason, and it's really important. This psalm is a lot like the Battle of Mayberry because it doesn't mean what most people think it means. It is not a soul-winning psalm. Now, growing up, that was the only way I ever heard it preached. I gave that long introduction for this one reason. I wanted you to never forget this fact. This is not a soul-winning psalm. In fact, I went online and tried to find people giving a right interpretation of the psalm, and these were the things I came up with. The seven G's of soul winning. Going, groaning, giving, guaranteeing, gladdening, grouping, and glorifying. And that sounds really good. And that really preaches well. But it's just wrong. It's not just one sermon. In fact, Psalm 126.6 is listed as one of the 25 most important verses on soul winning and witnessing in the Bible. And there are witnessing training guides that include this psalm as part of your witnessing to other people. In fact, one preacher called it the secret, quote, the secret of winning souls. 
Now, I want to be fair. There is some overlap of terminology. And so on the surface, when you're reading it, you can see why in plain English it would seem that's the case. In fact, look at the witnessing terms that you see here. Seed, planting, harvest. Those are all used in the New Testament in referencing to witnessing for Jesus Christ. So I can see why, at least on the surface, this can be confusing for some. Even the great Charles Spurgeon, the venerable prince of preachers, as he's known, misunderstood these text, this text. He wrote from it these words, quote, winners of souls are first weepers for souls, end quote. Now that's great advice, and that's great teaching, but that's not from this text. My job is not to reinforce a bad interpretation. My job is to help you and encourage you to see the text as it stands. So if this psalm does not refer to soul, if that's not what it means, then what does it mean? Number one, God's people give thanks for his gracious blessings. God blessed Israel by restoring their fortunes. Look at verse one. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, they, they returned from captivity to freedom. Now the word turned here, as it's translated in the Greek version of the Old Testament, is our common word for repentance, to turn. But in this context, it's not repentance. The Lord didn't return or, or help repent them to freedom. Instead, it's referring to people who had been in captivity, who were in slavery, who didn't have their freedom, being released to return to the land. And there are a lot of different views of what this kind of return means. Some people look at Old Testament examples, and you can think of some Old Testament examples of the people, who God's people, who were in bondage, who were returned to freedom. The first one that springs to my mind is Egypt, right? I mean, that's the most obvious. So some think maybe this is a psalm about Egypt. Others look at the judges and see different times during the judges when the people were under the, the heavy thumb of the Philistines. And then later, the Philistine uh, people, and then even Jewish wicked kings. And these are all pointed as possible answers. But I think the best answer is the Babylonian captivity. That after 70 plus years, the people returned in three different waves, three different returns to the land, and they were brought back out of captivity. And notice what he says. It's God's doing. We were, the Lord turned us back again from captivity into Zion. It's God's doing. Israel can't claim some great military victory. In fact, if you know anything about the Babylonian captivity, it was the Persian army, the Medo-Persian army, that liberated the Jews from the Babylonians. They destroyed Babylon. You remember the story in Daniel, the fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall, uh, takel, takel, you farsen, that were weighed in the balances and, and found wanting. You remember that story. And, and of course, uh, there that night, the king of Babylon is killed. And the Persian army under Darius, and then, of course, the king of Cyrus releases them. Oh, it takes them to Persia. Daniel ends up in Persia, but they liberate them from the Babylonians. And then you have the story of Esther, who is protected by a, a Persian king, who even then later sets them free. And so the people see, they're looking at this liberation as God's blessing them. The common word would be fortunate. God has turned our fortunes. Well, we would say it's all providential. Look what God's done. 
We were in captivity and we have been released. So what do they do? Look again at verse 1. We were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they, not the heathen speaking, I think, but the people speaking. Then we said among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for us or for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Wherefore, we are glad. The blessing from the Lord was abrupt. Seventy plus years in exile, and then in a moment, God is bringing them back to the land. It was sudden, and it was surprising, and in many cases, for many Jewish people, unexpected. And so he uses the expression, it's like someone dreaming. You know what that's like to be dreaming? Just before the, you... Well, waken in the morning, maybe the dream is really powerful. You're, it's really captivating your mind. You remember it. You don't always remember your dreams, but you remember this dream. This is what he's saying. It's, it's just like a dream. We couldn't believe it. It's almost like an Old Testament rapture moment. And I, there's no rapture in the Old Testament in the rapture sense. But God is returning his people to the land. And it was in a moment. It was in all of a sudden, and God's blessing brought immediate rejoicing. Look at the poetic expressions for thanksgiving. My mouth was filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with singing. There's just immediate joy on God's people because of what God is doing in their lives. Because of God's blessing, they just respond with rejoicing. This is verbal joy. And I stopped myself at, in my studies of this, and I started asking myself, what is verbal joy? What does it sound like? And of course, in a child, it's just laughter, right? They just laugh. We, you see verbal joy. Sometimes people shout. Sometimes they scream. But I think here, verbal joy is our testimony. I think what, what this psalm is driving at, the psalmist is saying, in a moment, we received what we did not think actually possible, that something we couldn't even imagine reoccurring. We didn't even, were even scared to think about that this could possibly happen again. And then it did. And now we rehearse it. To everyone, we rehearse it to the unsaved. Look what God is doing to us. We rehearse it and acknowledge it among ourselves. Look what God is doing for us. And this brings me to really an important application, and I think it's simply this. Friends, the thing that is so missing in our society, in our culture, is an acknowledgement of God's people, of his blessings on our lives. When God's people are even embarrassed to bow their heads and thank God for food that he's provided for them when they're in a restaurant. There is no way they can give verbal testimony to unbelievers of what God has done. But this is what happens. When you think, what has God done for me? Then you're able to verbalize it to other people. But when you just never think about it, you never rehearse it in your mind, well, how are you ever going to have a verbal testimony? How are you ever going to express verbal joy? How will you ever? The thing that most captivated these people and I use that word on purpose, is because they had been liberated by God from their captivity, and now they told everybody they met about it. They verbalized it everywhere they went. Let's take just a moment. This is maybe a little unusual, but I started the sermon in an unusual fashion, so let's just stay with the unusual theme. Let's take just a moment. Maybe two or three people could give a very quick, short, two or three sentence testimony of something that God has done for you. Somebody just, just shout it out. What has God done for you? Yes. 
That's, that's a blessing. That's a big blessing. Yeah, good. What else? What has God done for you? Yes, sir. All right. Well, that's a blessing. Praise the Lord for that. What else? What's a, what's a blessing? One more. Let's take one more. Come on. Somebody tell me a blessing. What has God done for you? What's he done? Amen. Thank you. And God gave you to us. And that's a blessing. I mean, God has blessed us in so many ways. But friends, why don't we verbalize it? Why don't we tell people? Why is it when we're talking to a neighbor, it doesn't come up? Let me just tell you what God's doing in my life. Well, he's not saved. He needs to hear it more than others. We need to be verbalizing our joy. And the reason why this is so important, the reason why I think the fact that we don't verbalize our blessings, the fact that we're very slow to give testimony to what God is doing is really evidence of a coldness that has settled into our spiritual hearts is because the fact that when we rehearse God's blessings, our praise for his blessings lead us, this is point number two, to pray that God will fulfill his promises in the future. You see, thanksgiving shapes our, bless our prayers. Blessings shapes, controls our prayers. We pray expectantly because of what God has already done for us. And when we're not thinking about what God has done for us, when we're thinking rather, always looking on what, what is in the immediate, my immediate needs, I've got work, I've got school, I've got problems, I've got to get all this accomplished, I've got family coming, I've got to bake all these pies for Christmas, I've got to buy all these presents, I've got all this stuff to complete. Boy, I, I just feel this weight and pressure, everything coming down on me. How are you ever going to pray expectantly with that? But when you're rehearsing what God has done for you, then your prayers, you see your prayers begin to turn and you begin to pray with an expectation that God will answer your prayers. You pray that God will fulfill his promises in the future. You see, the return of the people to the land did not immediately return their fortunes. You, you, if you think that they all got up and they walked back to Israel and they got back there and everything was nice and new and, and wonderful, then, then you misunderstand what's going on here. He says in verse 4, here's the prayer of the psalmist. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. You say, wait a minute. He just said we were captive and we were released from captivity. How are we still in captivity? And I think the reason for this is the land had been decimated. The Assyrians had taken most of the Judean cities captive. The people were left only with Jerusalem. And then the Babylonians came and the city itself was destroyed. The walls were torn down. Everything, all the houses in the city were burned and they left nothing behind, just ruins. And even worse, the great temple of God, the great temple of Solomon had been burned and the stones of the temple had been thrown down. That's what they walked back to. I mean, imagine, imagine this. You're on your way home from work next week. You get pulled over by a policeman and falsely arrested and taken to jail. And after a while, maybe a few days, since some legal maneuvering, it is proved that you are, you are not guilty of whatever crime they accuse you of committing. And so they release you. And you're excited. And you get home. And you find that the police in their fervor to prove their case against you, ransacked your house and tore everything apart, looking for evidence. Well, I'm glad I'm out of jail, but look what they did. This is kind of what's going on here, but on a, on a much bigger scale. Well, I'm no longer slaves to the Persians and Babylonians, but look what I have. There are no houses. There are no farms. This is their entire economy. If they're living in an agrarian system, there are no farms to be had. The only people the Babylonians left in Jerusalem after the final rebellion against them, when Nebuchadnezzar came back and said, fine, burn it all to the ground. 
and Nebuchadnezzar's generals destroyed the city completely. The only people who were left were the poor and the sick. There are no farms. There are no homes. There are no mansions. There is no temple. There are no walls. There's nothing. And that's what these people have. And so even while they're rejoicing for what God has done in releasing them from captivity, now they have turned their sights and said, we must pray and ask God to give us more blessings. These blessings that he's given us are great, but we need more from you. And their thanksgiving is now shaping their prayers. And I think in that sense, we can look at ourselves and see this truth. This is not a one-for-one -one parallel, but I think the principle is here. We can see ourselves being rescued from captivity in salvation, but we have burdens still. We must come back to God again in prayer. We have to bring our prayers to God again. We have spiritual burdens. What are the burdens on your heart? Your spiritual walk with Christ. How would you evaluate that? Would you say that you're excited about what God is doing in your life these days? Or would you say maybe you've drifted a bit in your walk with him? That maybe you're not reading your Bible as often as you did before. Maybe your prayer life has slipped from what it was before. Maybe there's a burden, a spiritual burden, because of your spouse, your wife, or your husband. And you have this burden on your heart because of your spouse. Maybe your burden is your children. And I don't know any Christian parent who doesn't have some burdens for children. Maybe your spiritual burden is your church family. What are your burdens? We have material burdens, finances, job pressures. We have physical burdens. Some of you live in chronic pain. Some of you experience sickness and some have diseases. And we have personal burdens, family, and even relationships. So what is our prayer? Look at the prayer that they pray. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. We bring our burdens to you, knowing what you've already done, knowing how you've taken good care of us up to this point, how you brought us back out of this Persian and Babylonian captivity. Now we say, Lord, give us more blessings as you bring water to the wadis of the south, these depressions in the land that in the summertime just look like it's just dry ground between two hills. But if you're there in the fall or you're there in the spring when the waters come, you better watch out because the waters swoosh through those, air, those areas like a flood, like a torrent, and will actually take your life if you're not careful. These waters refill the wadis. They call them wadis, these depressions between two hills. They call them wadis. They're dry. He says, return the, your, your blessings like streams return in the south. Bring your blessings back to us. We are dry. We, are, we, we don't have what we need. Lord, we depend entirely on you and gush down your blessings like torrents. That's the prayer. When you pray about your spiritual burdens, that's your prayer. Lord, return your blessings upon me. Like, like those waters fill those wadis, like, like the floodwaters. And if you want to put it into the current North Carolina vernacular, God, bless me like you flood Crabtree Mall. There we go, right? That's really what we're asking. Lord, I, I need your blessing. I need this answer. Return this blessing to me. And you take your financial pressures and your job pressures and your physical burdens and your sickness, your disease. You take your personal problems. You bring it all to God. And, and what do you bring it on? What basis? On what God has already done for you. 
He's already saved you. He's already brought you, in, in, at least in some respects, to a place of rejoicing in a Christian experience. Now you can say, Lord, I know what you've already done for me. Now what I'm asking you to do for me in the future is shaped by what you've done for me in the past because I know you're a loving God and I know you're a compassionate God and I know that you care for me. And Lord, I need you. And you pray like that expecting God to fulfill his promises. You look at verse 5. They that sow in tears, how do they reap? In joy. Everyone who goes forth and weeps, what does it mean to go forth and weep? To sow in tears. Everybody who goes forth and sows, they bearing, they're bearing their seed shall doubtless come again rejoicing. And why are they rejoicing? Because they're bringing with them their sheaves. Restoring the land is going to be very hard. You remember, they get there, there's nothing left. The walls are broken down. The temple is destroyed. There is a beautiful story in the Old Testament of when they laid the foundations and kind of prop back up parts of the old temple. The old men took off their hats and they put it over their hearts and they wept. And the noise, the writer of uh, uh, the story says, you couldn't tell from the people cheering and rejoicing and the weeping. You couldn't tell the sound. You didn't know which was louder because those old people had seen that former temple and they were remembering as children they saw it. They're remembering what they had lost. Even while the people were rejoicing. See, the, they came back to the land and they had nothing. And now, imagine how hard it's going to be to rebuild some of those farms. They're going to have to figure out what land is theirs. And they're going to have to take that farm and they're going to have to start rebuilding, tearing out what the Babylonians had done to the farms in destroying their farms. They have to rebuild the houses. They've got to rebuild the, the barns. They have to take where the land has overgrown for 70 years, has overgrown the buildings with the ruins that are left, and they have to dig up the ground. It's a complete rebuild. Everything has got to be moved and fixed and torn down and restored. They have, they have to have all of this hard labor, this labor that's going to be weeping labor, weeping because of are remembering what they had, and weeping because of the hard work they have to do just to get some semblance of it back. And they're taking their, their hard work and they're working and every day, long hours, just to get a little bit back. You read the story of Nehemiah just trying to rebuild those walls and how hard it was, how long it took. He says, th this weeping will be turned to joy. This is the anticipation of God's blessings because they expect, even though the fields have been long deserted, we come back and plant again, we will reap a harvest again. Now, if you understand anything about the Abrahamic covenant, this is the fulfillment of that. These people are coming in prayer back to God based on his covenant, based on what he's done for them, the land seed blessing covenant, land, and they are coming back to God and they're saying, okay, God, give us this land again. Restore this land as it once was, but it's going to require an awful lot of work. And they anticipate God's blessing. They anticipate the harvest that they'll get from the long deserted fields and they rejoice when the harvest comes because they have sheaves of grain. It's incredible what God can do in a life. Now, see, you're sitting here, and I understand everybody's different. Everybody has different burdens. And maybe your burden is spiritual. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's personal. I, I don't know specifically what your burden is. Some, some of you I have a, a good idea, but most of you I don't know specifically what your burden or burdens are. 
But if you can see what God has done for you in the past, and you can see the promises that God has given you in his word, then you can pray those promises, understanding what God has done in the past, and you can bring them right to the Lord and say, okay, God, do it again. Bring back your blessing again. We don't have a land blessing. You, you read Deuteronomy, and next year I'm going to preach on De in Deuteronomy for a little while. But you read through Deuteronomy and just highlight, I've told you this before, every time it talks about land. And you understand that that is a promise given to those people. They have that land. One day when Jesus comes back, they will get that land again. It's the promise of God to them. It's their land. It's not anybody else's. It's theirs. You understand, if you understand all of that, then you know we don't have a land blessing. But what blessings do we do have? We have so many. There's so many things that we can look at and claim in these New Testament promises of God. And we can claim them for our spiritual lives. We can claim them for our material things. Give us this day our daily bread. We can claim them for our physical lives. We can claim them for our relationships. We can claim all of those promises of God and we can bring them right back to God saying, okay, God, I know what you did for me in the past. Now here's what I'm expecting you to do for me in the future because you have laid it out in your word and you can pray God's words right back to him with an expectation that he will. And though you pray with tears, you reap a harvest in your life of joy. And that's where you can make application here. Because that's really the lesson that's being said. The people who anticipated God's promises to be fulfilled, though it was hard and difficult work, rejoiced when God did it. And we can take the same principle and apply it to our lives. Lord, we have so many obstacles, so many burdens. We bring it back to you. And based on your promises, we ask you, God, fulfill your word again. Now, I think what that means, friends, is this. You can pray for that mom to be saved. Or that dad. You can take that prayer to God. You can pray for that job situation to be rectified. The difficult boss. Or the difficult subordinates at work who are giving you problems. You can take that to the Lord. Or maybe just coworkers, colleagues. You can pray for your grandchildren in school. You can pray for our missionaries to have boldness to give the gospel on the foreign field. You can pray for our church to be unified. You can make all these prayers. And though it's hard work, and though it's difficult work, you can bring these prayers to God and say, okay, God, now do what you told, you've always promised you'd do in the past, and you did, and now, Lord, what you've promised to do in the future, do it. You bring those promises to God and you lay them before his feet. And I think that makes this psalm really a thanksgiving prayer. To look at God's blessings and say, what has God done? What has God done? What has he promised? Now, how will I pray? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word because in understanding it, it gives us great blessing. And though this psalm has been often misunderstood and by many, I pray, Lord, you'd help us to understand it so that we could leave here with a thought that's righteous, that's true, that based on your work in the past, we can claim promises for the future in prayer. And help us to pray that way. Instead of having cold hearts that ignore the things we must be thankful for, help us to have warm hearts that allow those thanksgivings to shape our prayers. Before I finish praying, I want to ask you a question. How many of you are praying to God based on what he's done for you in the past? 
Are you thankful for what he's done for you? Are you quick to tell others, even unbelievers, of his blessings? And will you let those blessings shape your prayers? Now, maybe God has been dealing with you while I've been preaching this message. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been working in your heart. I would really, really love to pray for you. You say, Pastor, pray for me. Just raise your hand. I'll pray for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else, Pastor, pray for me. Help me to be quick with thanksgiving and help me to let my prayers be shaped by my blessings. What has God done for me? What has God promised me? And how will I pray? Lord, may that be our thought today as we leave here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Just a prayer of consecration as we close today as the pianist plays. You just go to the Lord in prayer and you just answer those questions. What has God done for me? Um, what are his promises? How will I pray? You just go to the Lord, bring that to the Lord and consecrate that in your heart as she plays. Thank you. Be seated. Hey, tonight, 530, we're going to be talking about the virgin birth from the Gospel of Matthew, just looking at the data that's there and, and really kind of exploring why uh, we got off track. So last time, two weeks ago, uh, we went through a really difficult message on the Old Testament uh, prophecy from Isaiah 7, uh, the differences between those two Hebrew words. And that was a hard message I'm, I'm sure to sit through is hard to preach but we're going to reap the blessings tonight by looking at now what Matthew says about Isaiah 7 and how that just totally fits with where we are and we'll also kind of look a little bit at why so many people have rejected this so this will be helpful for you I think as we continue our study on the virgin birth by the way virgin birth probably one of the most well it is one of the top two most important apologetic doctrines in scripture the other being the resurrection no virgin birth no resurrection you just christianity's out the window and there's just so many people who are attacking it today so i think this will be good for you so that's tonight uh, at 5 30 i hope you'll come back for that raja would you close in prayer please Our father in heaven we thank you we thank you for this morning and we thank you for your goodness Thank you for the reading of the day. Yes, Father, as we speak, uh, some of us are going through hard times. Yes, there's not even language to this, but Father, the day is perfect for us. And we thank you. And we thank you for what you're going to 